gangster fellow countrymen. This was the position of the Garibaldi battalion. Headquarters was near the woods. The fascists were here, here, all in this area. Then, at about noon, we saw two cars go by. We stopped them and they said to us, but we are Italians. We answered, we're Italians too. Giovanni Pesci and his comrades had found just what they had come to Spain for, the opportunity to fight Italian fascists. They started to raise their hands, very worried, and began to cry, don't shoot us, we are Italians too. It's not our fault if Mussolini sent us here. They told us they were sending us to Abyssinia. We took them prisoner and took them to the command. When the Republican troops routed the Italian opposition, Mussolini was furious. He decided that no Italian could return home until they'd won a victory. Foreign aid on both sides poured into Spain at a faster rate than ever before. But it was not enough to clinch the war, only to prolong it. And Madrid was now a stalemate. It remained so until the end of the war, two years later. So the nationalists switched their offensive to the north. The western part of the Basque country was still Republican. It had been separated from the main Republican zone since the early days of the war. This northern region was a potentially valuable prize in account of its heavy industry and mineral wealth. It was a special region in other ways. Here, conservatives were fighting side by side with anarchists and socialists. The Basque gave the lie to Franco's claim that his campaign was a Christian crusade. The region is the most devout Catholic area in the country. Here people prayed for victory against the nationalists. Their opposition to Franco and support for the Republic came from the traditional Basque yearning for the home rule of their region, so distinctive from the rest of Spain. The Liberal Republic recognized that ambition, but the nationalists who believed in the unity of Spain were determined to crush it. The attack began on March 31st. The nationalist, General Moller, threatened to raise the region to the ground. He nearly succeeded. But first, the nationalists tried to starve the Bas into submission. A sea blockade of Republican ports posed an embarrassing problem for Britain. Several British merchant ships legally commissioned to deliver food supplies to the Republic, were stuck in the French port of Saint-Jean-de-Luz. The British government was reluctant to challenge Franco's navy by supplying escorts for their merchantmen. Despite outcry from the House of Commons, Eden announced that British ships would be protected only outside a three-mile limit of Bilbao. At the same time, the British were secretly negotiating with the nationalists for the output of British-owned mines in Spain. On April 19, 1937, a Captain Roberts, the master of one of those ships, the Seven Seas Spray, became anxious to leave Saint-Jean-de-Luz before his cargo rotted. Captain Roberts defied the British order and set sail for Bilbao. His daughter, Fifi, was on board. So at 10 o'clock we darkened ship and pulled up anchor and uh, sailed out. Frantic flashings from the shore, and a searchlight was played on us, but um, Father was doing an Nelson act, you see, and he, he just shut that eye, and we sailed on. I mean, there's nothing to it. In spite of the warnings of the British government and the threats that Bilbao Harbour had been mined by the nationalists, the Seven Seas Spray arrived unscathed and sailed up Bilbao River. We were the first in and we're told there's only four days food left for the people. Everybody was cheering, hooters were going. It was rather like a ticker tape reception. Only we were coming up the river and everybody was hanging out from all their windows and waving and cheering. It was quite emotional.
Captain Roberts and Fifi became the Basque people's heroes. The Seven Seas Spray had exposed the nationalist blockade as a myth, and other British merchant ships followed with food supplies. But the Basque couldn't celebrate for long. Ten miles behind the front line was the small market town of Galica, with a population of 7,000. It was the historic center of Basque nationalism. The tree of Galica, the symbol of Basque freedom, stood beside the parliament building where traditionally all Spanish monarchs had sworn to uphold Basque liberties. April 26th, 1937, was market day. <laughs> The market was held where the public gardens of Guernica are now. Everything was normal, but then the planes came in the afternoon. Doña Ignatia Othomith lived in Guernica with her two daughters, Coni and Manoli. We were in the industrial zone, and over the hills opposite, I saw the planes arriving. First, just one of them. It circled twice, but we were used to seeing it do that and fly away again. But scarcely 10 or 15 minutes later, more arrived, and we were able to count them. There were eight, all in a line, black. I remember them as very black and ugly. I'll never forget the noise the bombs made. A kind of fizz. Followed by cries. Then a tremendous crash, over and over again. I can still hear the noises. And we could feel everything tremble. Smoke and heat came in. 43 aircraft, mainly German, took part in wave after wave of attacks on the small town. Carl von Canal was a squadron leader of the Condor Legion, which bombed Genica. This had no impact on me. I conducted these attacks and operations in the course of my duties as a soldier, carrying out my orders without heed for my life. At the time, we thought we were fighting a war against communism. The Condor Legion might have believed the Catholic Bars were communists, but the Spanish high command who ordered the attack knew otherwise. For both of them, Genica's cultural significance was more or less irrelevant. It was a military target. There was a small arms factory. A Republican soldier retreating from the nationalist attack had to pass through the town to reach the last line of defense round Bilbao. The Germans claimed that instructions were to bomb the bridge and crossroads at the edge of Genica in order to make the road to Bilbao impassable. In three hours, 100,000 pounds of incendiary, high explosive and shrapnel bombs were dropped on the town. Little remained standing, except the arms factory and the Germans' main target, the bridge. We could clearly see that the wind blew the bombs onto the fields. They missed the bridge and the houses by it. The Junkers were really commercial airplanes converted into bombers. That is, they were equipped with what we called a pot slung underneath the plane. It could be retracted during takeoff and landing and lowered during flight. And the poor observer had to climb down a tiny ladder into this contraption with his goggles and his flying helmet on. And there he had a primitive targeting device and rangefinder. The Germans' excuses don't explain why they did not use accurate Stuka dive bombers to destroy their objective, the bridge at the edge of Genica, nor the fact that they machine gunned the fleeing population, nor the magnitude of the whole operation. I can still remember, and I was just nine years old, the force of the blast of heat in my face as I came out. All the buildings next to the factories were burning, everything on fire. The sky was red with reflections. Two days after the bombing, 
Fifi Roberts was taken with her father to see the devastation of the town. 45 years later, 